we see that the motive of Paul's ministry, verse 19 says, I served the Lord. I did what I did. I sacrificed what I sacrificed because I was driven to serve and please the Lord Jesus Christ. I wasn't doing it to get into heaven. Jesus, on the, his shed blood, got me into heaven. Amen? But now because he saved me, I want to serve him. Something happened in my heart. And we studied that. We looked at the, the motive of his ministry. The reason he did what he did. He said, I'll serve the Lord. I wasn't in it for making money. I wasn't there to enjoy an easy life. But as a servant of the Most High God, I generously pleased God. And that was Paul. He was a man totally devoted to Jesus. I sacrifice, I'm willing to suffer, I'm willing to labor, I'm willing to give my best because of Jesus, amen? And in fact, if you would, look, look at 2 Corinthians 5, 13 through 15. 2 Corinthians 5, and we say, what motivated him? Well, one of the greatest things that motivated Paul was the love of Christ, the love of Christ. And when you truly love Jesus, something will happen in your life, amen? When you, when you recognize his love for you and that turns into a love for him, it changes you, it drives you, it fuels you. Yeah, I mean, it changes your vision. It changes your everything. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 13 through 15. And again, um, Paul mind. It's for the sake of God. If we're in our right mind, it's for you. People had been accusing him of being fanatical. Maybe you came out of a family that wasn't saved and you got radically saved and they thought, you, you're, you're getting nuts. You're just getting this too religious. You're getting, you're getting carried away here. Anyone? You're getting carried away. This is too much. Look, we're all religious. We got first and second communion. We don't act like that. Amen? But when you met Jesus and things were radically changed, people began to think, man, you're out of your mind. You're just not. Nah, this is it. And Paul says, now, if I am out of my mind trust me it's for the sake of God amen but if I'm in my right mind and doing what I do it's so hopefully you can know him like I know him amen and Paul says here's the reason it's Christ's love that compels us or constrains us or drives us his love compels us because we're convinced that he died for all therefore we die I'm convinced Jesus died for me are you convinced of that I'm convinced he died for me when I was lost and unworthy and that revelation hit my heart and now I love him in return and I live wholeheartedly I'm willing to lay down whatever he wants, go where he wants me to go. Why? The love of Christ constrains me. Amen. And Paul said, that's my motive. Why do you get here early? Our brother George gets here so early. He opens up. He's here sometimes an hour. So I've seen him here. I look out my window more than an hour before service. He's here opening up, turning lights on, getting the place going. Love of Christ compels him. He does it unto the Lord. Amen. He don't get paid a nickel. Isn't that right? No one, I you know, most people don't say thank you. But man, I'll tell you what, he's here. Why? The love of Christ compels him. We're willing to give our very best to serve others because the love of Christ compels us. And Paul goes on, he says, listen, I believe he died for all that those who live, that's you and I, should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and was raised again. When the love of Christ gets a hold of your heart, you want to live for the one that died for you. Amen? You want to give him first place. And so that's the motive. And now his motive affected his manner. Because he loved Jesus and he was driven by his love for Jesus, it affected how he ministered to men. It affected how he treated others. It attracted what he was willing to do. And that's where we're camping out now. Not only the motive, but the manner of his ministry. Because his motive was to please and glorify the Lord, it affected the manner or the expression of his ministry. How he treated others was affected by how he loved Christ. If I love Christ, I'm going to treat you different. If I really love Christ, remember Jesus said, if you do it unto me, you know, you do it. See, when you do it unto the Lord, that means doing it to people. That, that means I serve you wholeheartedly, not lazily. I'm going to give you my best because I'm serving the Lord. Amen? And we see that. And Paul says in verse 19, in the manner of his ministry, he says, I served with, with great humility. With great humility. Now the manner of the ministry, that's the expression of the ministry. I'm driven by this love for Christ. I'm driven because I'm serving the Lord. But how I express it, or the manner in which I minister, so number one, there's a humility in it. Amen? It's not in a boastful way. It's not in a haughty way. It's with a humbleness. And Jesus gave us that great example when he washed their feet, right? And he says, this is true ministry. And he gave them an example. Jesus, Lord of all, actually taking the place of a servant, a lowly servant, and washing feet. He says, now, if you can get the symbolism here. I'm not asking you to, to wash someone's ugly bunions. But what I am asking you to do 
is if you're going to teach that little class, you love those kids, and you show up on time, and you prepare. If you're going to be there to open up, you open up. If you're going to take on a role, you do it like you were doing it to me. You do it just like I was going to walk in, and you're going to teach that class to me. You go to that nursing home, you envision you're going to go and sit down and talk with Jesus and, and give him a cup of water and talk with him and give him a little encouragement, a little comfort. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about here. There's humility. And we talked about great humility. We said humility really stretches three ways. There's obviously our humbleness before God. We humble ourselves before God. But secondly, we humble ourselves towards men. My attitude towards you is not haughty, but it's humble. It's a servant, preferring one another better than ourselves. The Bible says that's how we get along. We consider others better than, than ourselves. And so towards ourselves, but even towards our outlook on ourselves, we put ourselves in proper perspective. And we recognize this by the grace of God, I am who I am. Amen? Whatever we do, we put our attainments in the things we achieved in proper perspective. For by the grace of God, amen, there go I, right? Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. So there's, there's a humility, and that's where, we're, and last time we stopped right here, and then he says in verse 19, and with tears, and with tears. Let's look at that. Paul serves the Lord with humility and, and with tears. What's he talking about? There was a sincerity in the way he served. There was a sincerity in the way he served. He didn't just go through the motions. There was something heartfelt about it. There was a sincerity, there was a genuineness about it. He didn't just do it outwardly. There was something in his heart that moved him. He wept with those that wept. He, he burdened with those that were burdened. He rejoiced with those that rejoiced. He had a genuine love and affection for others. Paul served with great tears. He had a tender, patient, compassionate, burdened heart for those in which he ministered to. You see, we, we do it from the heart, amen? We do the will of God, the Bible says, from the heart. And um, Paul's zeal for the Lord caused him to be pained and grieved when God was pained and grieved. When God was dishonored, it affected Paul. You know, he, when you love someone, typically when they hurt, you hurt, amen? When, when, when they're broken, you get broken. And that's how Paul was here. One writer says, those that share Paul's passion will share his tears. As Paul ministered, um, it, things would pain him and grieve him and things would affect him. Why? Because he meant he was serious about what he did. He wasn't just in it for ulterior motives. And if we could notice three things out of many, but three things in particular that would move Paul to really being pained within, maybe move Paul to tears. Three things. Number one, Paul was grieved over the state of the lost. If I'm going to be an effective minister of Christ, I, I've got to love and have a burden for the lost. Amen? It doesn't matter. Not everyone's a wonderful evangelist. Not everyone, you know, uh, just has the ability to go and talk to people, whether it be McDonald's or at the bank. I mean, some people have that ability, but everyone should have a burden for souls. If they meant so much to the Lord that he went and died for them, that we should care about the lost. Amen? There should be something about us. Hey, they're standing where we once stood. I mean, why, why pick on them? We were once blind like that. Amen? We once said dumb things like they might be saying. We once looked at Christ in the way they're now looking because we were lost. We were blind. Amen? And we should have a heart for that. And how many remember Jesus? The Bible says he looked over the city in Luke's gospel. He, he looked, Luke 19, he looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. Jesus wept. Jesus had tears. He wept because he said, you didn't recognize my appearing, therefore you rejected your Savior. Because he saw people that wouldn't recognize the truth and the right way to go in the gospel and their Messiah. They rejected him. And he knew if you rejected him, you've got the, the judgment that comes as a, a return for that. And he wept over the city because they didn't recognize him. And therefore they rejected him. If you reject him, there's a ripple effect in one's life. And Jesus wept. You know, Paul, in Acts 17, he went to Athens. Athens, Greece. Remember, that's the place of all the great philosophers, and they had hundreds and thousands of gods. And the Bible says he was grieved in his heart. He was anguished in his heart. How's it? Um, greatly distressed. He was provoked in his spirit, one translation says, as he saw how lost men are. Sometimes you can visit a, a great city and sometimes you can see depths of sin that you didn't even really know existed when you just lived in small town America. You could see things that make you, oh my God, I, I never thought that, I thought that was just on TV. You could see the sickest things. And, and, it, and if you're godly at all, it just grieves you and it just breaks you. 
and it just makes you weep. Isn't that right? You see children, you want to in the morning, they're out running the streets. Man, they're eight years old. You say, oh my goodness. You see crazy things happening. And if you have any God in you at all, it's got to break you. It's got to make you want to scream, oh Lord. And Paul was greatly distressed in his spirit. Why? He had love for souls. He saw men as, the, uh, always playing that Carmen tape, kidnapped royalty, that's one of his songs, kidnapped royalty. He saw them lost and bound and just living horribly in pain and sorrow of sin, but he knew they weren't meant to be like that. They were made in God's image and they were made to be redeemed by God's blood, but they're lost. He grieved, he grieved. Look if you would at Romans 9, Romans 9, 2 and 3. Paul grieved over the state of the lost. Look what Paul writes here. This is pretty heavy stuff, amen? Hey, listen, I, I, I love my family. I know you love your family. I don't know if I'm willing to go to hell for my family, okay? I mean, I, I love them a lot, isn't that right? But, but I, I, come on, say amen. Don't look so pious at me now, that's all right. Um, Paul writes, I have great sorrow in unceasing anguish in my heart. So my heart breaks. My heart is pained. And I, I, want to, I want to say this because, you know what, it is very easy for us to get callous and complacent towards the souls of men. There is a certain self-preservation in, in, in being callous. You, you can't live. You, you, you want to jump off the roof if you look at every, all the heart. But we can get to the point where nothing moves us anymore. Where nothing moves us. We're so caught in being so insular and doing our own thing that we don't weep for souls. We don't have a burden for missions. And God's not pleased with that. If we're going to be ministers that please the Lord, we're going to have a heart for what God has a heart for. Now I'll tell you what, God's got a heart for souls. God has a heart for souls. Good, bad, and the ugly. Amen? All sinners are sinners. They, they might be in the penthouse or the outhouse. They all need Jesus. And, and, and if we're going to reach them, we better get a heart for them. Amen? And here Paul, Paul's writing, he says, I have, a, I have great sorrow, unceasing anguish in my heart. What's going on, Paul? What's going on? He, in fact, he says, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Those are my own race. Man, that's powerful, isn't it? Now, now Paul knows that's impossible because everyone has to stand before God on their own. But can you sense his heart here? Can you hear Paul's heart? Can you hear the burden and the pain in his heart? He said, I, I wish I could be cut off. I could be anathema. That's anathema. I could be a curse and just cut off for, from Christ for the sake of my brothers. Wow. That's a burden for souls right there. Amen. That's a burden for souls. We can at least invite him to church. If we're not going to go to hell for him, we can at least invite him. Isn't that right? We, we can at least tell him that Jesus loves him. We can at least tell him that there's, there's an answer outside of drink and drugs and, and craziness. We can at least, I mean, um, so we talk about Paul says with cheers. Paul, Paul his, his ministry was one of a sincere heart. He really cared and meant what he did. That's why he was passionate. That's why he moved like this. So there's, he grieved over the state of the lost. You know he grieved over struggling, straying, sinning Christians. Christians. If you would, um, Psalms 119 and 136. Psalm 119 and 136. Look at this. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. They all grieve us when we see supposedly Christians just ignoring and mocking the word of God. Supposedly saved people. Supposedly, but only God knows. Sometimes not enough fruit for us to know. Uh, only God can know. Isn't that right? Sometimes not enough fruit for, a, for, for, for us to tell. Maybe God can see. But here the psalmist said, I'm weeping. Why? Because I see those that supposedly know God being so flippant and disrespectful that they would live so blatantly anti what God has clearly written, and it doesn't even bother them. The psalmist said, there's some tears. It ought to grieve us to see the backsliders. It ought to just break our heart to see those that could care less. Don't, don't, don't listen. On one hand, don't condemn them, but don't you dare celebrate them. Don't you dare act like what they're doing is all right, or God will deal with you just as bad as he's going to deal with them. Come on, say amen if you agree. That's all right. No, 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 you don't got to condemn them, but don't you celebrate them. Amen? The Bible says if we love them, we're going to speak truth in that love. And you can be, you know, you, you can be, you don't have to be nasty to be firm. 
You don't have to be abrasive to be truthful, but you do need to be clear. Tears, streams of tears flow. Why? The law of God is not obeyed. The people that God gave the word to act like God never spoke. They live their lives totally disrespecting God, and they don't even tremble over it. Wow. Look at 2 Corinthians 2 and 4. 2 Corinthians 2 and 4. Now, this is what Paul writes. He's dealing in the church scenario with, with um, saints that have sinned and some have not come to repentance, some have not been restored and all that. And he says, For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, says, my heart was broken. When you hear about splits and you hear about people falling away and you hear about you know, Christian man, oh man, you hear about these things. Paul says, it shouldn't be said of the redeemed. That should be the testimony of the world. It shouldn't be said of the redeemed, amen? Now the world goes and lives certain ways, but that's how the world is. They don't know the Lord, but not all those of us that supposedly know God. We live different, shouldn't we? We know better, don't we? For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears. Not, not to grieve you, I'm not trying to condemn you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. See, because Paul loved people, he could weep for people. Because Paul loved people, it broke his heart when people backslid and sinned. He, he couldn't just wink it off or whitewash it as if it's okay, but see, he knew it wasn't okay. We're trying to get the measure of a minister. The, the measure of a minister humbly as they serve. We're servants. It's not about recognition. It's not about all these things. It's about pleasing the Lord and, and touching people in His name and doing what He would do. Amen? But it's also something we're driven by love for men. It causes us to weep for the lost because it's not, he, God's not willing that anyone perishes. And God's grieved. God's grieved because so many are lost and, and no one's telling them the good news. That people aren't saved and, and no one will go and, and be that good Samaritan that will reach down and go into their ugliness of their mess and try to lift them up and tell them there's hope in Jesus and in His church. This is His bride. And sometimes we never weep for the church when we see such nonsense and such foolishness. You see... Another area, the third area that Paul would be brought to tears, that Paul's heart would really be, be, be um, burdened and, and would um, be pained is when he talked about the false teachers and the false doctrines and lies that were trying to attack the flock and trying to deceive the people of God. Um, if you would look at Acts 20 and 31, Paul's going to say this later on in this speech. We won't get to it probably for about four or five weeks, but this is our, our text later on in, in, this, in this farewell. Look what Paul writes. He says, so be on your guard. Remember, he's talking to the leaders. He says, be on your guard and remember that for three years, he's with them for three years, for three years he goes, I never stop warning each of you night and day with tears. He's warning about wolves coming in in sheep's clothing. He's warning them about people that are going to come up and try to pull them away with false doctrines and all. And, and Paul says, I warned you. So when I repeat myself, I'm just being biblical. There are certain things worthy of repetition, is there not? There, there are certain things, if you don't get it by the time Jesus calls me home or takes me somewhere, then I miss the whole mark. Amen. If you don't get some things, I don't care if you get every, don't get everything, and some of the fool, I don't care about a lot, but certain things, you're either saved or you're lost. You're going to heaven, you're going to hell. And there is no purgatory. Oh, come on, say amen. amen. Oh, we got to get it right. We got to get it right. You see. He said, I, I warned you. Paul said, I warned you. No, Paul said, I was diligent about this. Peter said a similar thing. Peter says, and I'll say it again. He talks about repetition, being a safeguard. Peter says, it's a safeguard for you. I'm going to tell you again. I'm going to tell you again. There's a lot of wolves in sheep's clothing. I'm going to tell you again. There's a lot of false doctrines out there. It'll be reinforced when you watch NBC, CBS, and ABC. They'll just reinforce the godlessness. But you've got a Bible. 
and God gave you a head that you can read that Bible. Amen? You don't got to be deceived by anybody. You don't got to know Greek and Hebrew. God has so blessed us through history that men of God, women of God gave their lives so you and I can have the Word of God in our own language. Amen? No priest got to interpret it for us. No one's got to tell us. You can pick it up and read it and the God and God the Holy Spirit can teach you and you can know God and how to live for God. Amen? So when they try to tell you it's okay to live together, you say, the devil is a liar. That book says, uh-uh, you don't live together unless you're married. Isn't that right? They try to say it's okay for a man to be with man. You say, the devil is a liar. He made him Adam and Eve. No, 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 no. That, that it's a demon spirit, that homosexuality. That's a devil. Perversion. You know that's right. Isn't that right? We just all allow that. Sometimes the church just allows it to come in. We're so afraid uh, of getting so mad at us. I think God's mad at us sometimes. We were preaching Sunday about you can't be neutral. You know what Elijah told him? How long will you dance between two opinions? The Baal's God serve Baal at the Lord's, but you can't, you got to choose. You know, you can't be neutral. I'll never forget years ago, Pastor Beach, I went to be with the Lord not too long ago, that, that man of God. Um, there was a time during Elam Fellowship, there was some friction in the leadership, and it happened to be between the, the founder and his son, the, the heir apparent, you know. So Brother Spencer and Carlton were kind of, um, they had a disagreement on something, amen. And, and Pastor Beach, of course, being the son-in-law, uh, of the founder and, and being the brother-in-law of the heir apparent, he's kind of being asked by everyone, well, George, what do you think? Well, George, what do you think? And he says, people had asked me, and he goes, I, I just, I'm neutral. I'm neutral. He says, I say that about three times, the fourth time. I'm neutral. And as loud as I can hear, God says, well, I'm not, George. So find out where I am and get there. <laughs> How many know God's not neutral? Right. Let's find out where God is and get there. Can you say Amen. amen. Be on your guard. He says, be on your guard. Be on. Fathers, heads of homes, be on your guard. We live in a wicked age. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. A little leaven mess up that whole loaf. A little bit, a little bit, a little bit. It takes a little bit. Be on your guard. Be on your guard. He says, for three years, as long as I was with you, I never stopped. Paul says, like a broken record, but my heart was burdened for you. I remind you, be careful. Be alert. Stick with the Bible. Amen? Stay in the house of God. Stay close to Jesus. Stay close to Jesus. Amen? If you're going to choose sides, choose the Lord's side. Choose the Lord's side. Choose the Lord's side. Philippians 3, 18 and 19. Philippians 3, 18 and 19. Again, he was grieved. Paul was grieved. And one of the things that grieved Paul and pained Paul was the danger of the false teachers towards the sheep, towards the sheep. You know how that is, isn't that right? You, 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 your kid goes away for the first time, and you know, you pace the floor half that night praying the Holy Ghost. I mean, you, you know, until you, you get that victory, you know what I mean? Because there's that burden, there's that love, there's that care. Paul says, for as I have often told you before, I now say it again, even with tears. Paul says, I'm telling you this. It don't please me to tell you this. It'd be a lot easier just to, do something sweet and nice and you know what I mean? There'll be no conviction, there'll be no challenge. At the end there'll be no disciples, but you know, but it'll be religious. And I've told you this, even with tears, many live as enemies. Not of the miracles of Christ. They all like a miracle, isn't that right? You start getting that miracle power flow and they show up, man. Oh, they'll show up. They'll show up. Isn't that right? It's just an, you scratch your head. You see God healing people, and you know they're not, they're not even close to being saved, but when God starts to move, it's just, oh, Lord. No, then I, of, 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 of the love of Christ. No, not, not the enemy of the love of Christ. One loves the love of Christ. The teachings of Christ? The cross of Christ. Cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction for their God. It's materialism. It's the temporal. It's all about what's in it now. 
It's all about their God is in their stomach and their glory ultimately them shame. The things they boast about, the things they tell you are so important ultimately will bring them shame. Why? Their minds on earthly things. There's the cross, the cross, the cross strips men of its boasting. The, the, the cross breaks that pride of life. Amen? The, the cross makes all these things that we thought was so important nothing. Nothing. Isn't that right? When we used to think this was so important, we used to think that's what life was all about, then we really met the Lord, and we really understood how He died on the cross for me, and I was unworthy, and God loved me so much. And when we understood the cross, my sins put me there. And we understood it's not about these temporal things, it's about eternity. What matters for eternity? Oh, yeah. A lot of people, Paul weeps because they're enemies of the cross. And so they, they, they're, they're, they're um, diluting the true gospel. They're perverting or twisting the true gospel. They're making it a, a religious self-help thing. You know. But Paul says, oh, the cross. The cross where the Savior died. The cross where I died. Amen? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So Paul, Paul had a heart. Paul had a heart for, for, for ministry. So not only do, do, we, do we minister wholeheartedly, but we should minister with a sincerity and a real love for people. And we should be grieved by the things that grieves God. We should be moved to see the lost saved. We, we should be moved to see the backsliders wakened up and come back to really serving God like they should. Amen? We, we should be grieved when we see the enemy trying to deceive people and try to lead people astray. That, that ought to grieve us, as the Bible tells us here. With tears, with tears. The man, or how did he carry out or express his ministry? With great humility, with tears. Lastly, he served through severe trials with, with a wonderful endurance, with, with a, um, like a courageous, enduring soldier. He refused to quit. You see that in verse 19? Paul writes, with tears, although, see, Paul says, you know what? I kept going. I kept trusting. I kept obeying God. Although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. Wow. There was deep compassion and feeling, but then also, like a courageous, enduring soldier, he refused to quit. There was something in the man or woman of God that's going to be like Paul here. They have to be willing to take some shots for the cause of Christ. Make some sacrifices for the cause of Christ. Paul persevered. He was not a quitter. He didn't approach the work of the Lord with a list of conditions. If everything's just right, then I'll. Paul says, I'm so in love with Jesus. If hell throws the kitchen sink at me, you know where you're going to find me? At my duty station. You know where you're going to find me? Doing what God's called me to do. Look, if you would, at um, 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. He served through severe trial. And this is important because there is so much the enemy will try to do to discourage you from obeying your, the call on your life. You've got a call on your life. Everyone's got a call. Everyone's got a place to serve. In every season of our life has different challenges. And we can get busy here. We can get callous there. We can get overrun there. But we have to stay focused to do what God's called us to do. Because one day we will breathe our last breath. One day, if you're from this church, we'll take you across the street and say some pretty words about you. And then nothing matters but what was done for Christ ultimately. Amen? So, so when I tell you, give God first place, serve the Lord, one day when you stand before him, you say, man, I'm glad he harped me and all my other pastors and those that raised me in the Lord harped at us to be faithful to God and give God our best because when you see Jesus it will be worth it all. Amen? You won't have to be ashamed. You won't have to feel embarrassed when you see him because you know you live wholeheartedly here for him. Somebody say amen. amen. If we're going to be true ministers like Paul, this, this Paul model we'll have to endure hardship. We don't cry about hardship. We don't give up because of hardship. We don't start cursing out the brethren, blaming up. We endure hardship. We put up with it. In a war, there's hardship. Ever see a soldier, I'm going home, why they shot at me? Well, that's what they do, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I give up, I quit, I, I'm going home. Why are you going home? Well, it was a little rough sleeping on the ground last night. Well, it's going to get a whole lot rougher, son. Get out there, amen? But if we're going to serve God the way God wants us to serve, we're going to endure some hardship. It might not always be convenient. It might not always be comfortable. They might say you got to get there early, amen? They might expect you to be on time and ready to roll, prepared and prayed up and ready to give God your very best. 
endure hardship with us like what? Like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that beautiful? What, what a beautiful wording. Hey, man, and have you ever been in that military? God wants you to be a good soldier for Jesus now. He wants you to be a faithful soldier for the Lord. What's that next one say? Another verse up there. Number four. Wherefore art thou for? Here we go. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. When we're serving God, we've got to keep our priorities right. Amen? Amen? There'll be so many other things that, you know, and I know you've got to live a life, you've got to do this and that, but it's amazing. It's amazing how we can get a lot of other things start getting that primary importance and the things of God start, you know, they, they get, so no one's serving as a soldier. He just said he wants us to be good soldiers. Amen? He says, now if you're a soldier, remember, you've got to watch how involved you get with this world. I know there's normal things, and I know we live in this world, but don't get so caught up in the world where you can't find your place of service in his house, where you can't be doing your part and find your battle station in his house. That's what he's saying. Why? Because we want to please the commanding officer. Ultimately, when we stand before him, we want him to say, well done. And everyone's role is different. For some of these guys to keep the grounds looking beautiful, that's worship for them. That's their worship unto God. And the Lord receives that. You kept my house looking good. You kept my place looking sharp. For others, they've taught Sunday school for 30, 40, 50 years. And the Lord says, you don't know how many children you've led through John 3, 16. You'll know in eternity. Thank you for not being too good. Thank you for not being too good. For being too spiritual. To sit down with a four and five year old and explain John 3, thank you. Some people are, you know. Some people are. So, uh, others just come prayed up. Join Annette. You got more energy. Annette, I don't want to bottle whatever you got. You got that energy. And they're out there greeting people every Sunday. They're greeting every Sunday. Bubbled, bottled, you know, bouncy. I mean, they're just people come in to see happy people. When you come to church, you want to see someone happy. Isn't that right? I don't want to see a bunch of, oh, Lord, I turned right around. We missed it down the road. Must be another one. <laughs> Let's go. Keep on it going. We took a wrong turn. And Harry, we took a wrong turn. Now let keep on it going. No, but you know what? When you do it unto the Lord, isn't that right? You're ready to go. You're there. You're happy. You're, you know, I mean, unto the Lord. It's unto the Lord. I'm going to be a good soldier. I want to please my commanding officer. That's what it's all about. It's all about. And see, so Paul, he said, I endured hardship. Paul says, the devil don't make it easy for us to be faithful. The devil won't make it easy for us to be faithful. The devil won't make it easy for us to be successful. He doesn't want that church built. He doesn't want that class growing. He doesn't want that ministry flourishing. He'll tr and, and how do you do it? Well, you get rid of the leader. If you, if you get the teacher defeated, all well, the kids will get, you know what I mean? If you get the teacher discouraged and slothful, well, they're not prepared. They're not coming in with faith and with joy and expectation. Wow. Amen? I mean, you come into worship and you're ready to worship. Pastor Todd's going to take off and fly one day. We're going to sing, I fly away. He just might one day. I mean, I mean, get coming full of the Spirit. That's how you're supposed to do it, right? If you're going to be on the worship team, get full of that Spirit and worship. Let that thing splash off and hit a few people. Isn't that right? Trying to please my commanding officer. I'm telling you, we're going to sing one. I think he's going to take off. My Lord, I said, he grew about three feet. I said, no, he's just getting airborne. And all that joy. That's how it should be. Isn't that right? Amen. Amen. Joy and rejoice. And I'm going to wind this up, but I think we need to hear this. Because in this Christian culture, we've gotten so messed up. We, we, we bow to the God of convenience and comfort. And now you can't find people to serve. It's hard to find that continual because we've gone so much the other way about making everyone comfortable. But Paul said, I had such a driving passion in my heart to please Jesus. When I realized his love for me, and that love just ignited me. Now I love him. I am willing to put up. I am willing to sacrifice. I am willing to endure if it pleases him. And that love, I can start looking at people through his eyes. So I don't look at them as an inconvenience. I look at it as a privilege. I can tell someone about Jesus. I can take those boys or girls and the rangers and the missionettes and we could teach them stories. We could tell them about how they godly men and women. Oh man, I'm telling you. But the devil won't make it easy. And you've got to recognize that. I'm going to finish this up, but hang in there. 
willing to endure the hardship and the sacrifice and the opposition to do what God called him to do, faithful towards the Lord and to the Lord's people. Despite terrible trials, setbacks, rejections, he kept on serving faithfully with a patience and a fortitude to continue on in the work. At times, everyone's tempted to give up, but we don't give up, we get up and we go back. We remind ourselves why we're doing it. We remind ourselves that it will be worth it all. Amen? And we make up our mind, you can count on me. You can count on me. Lord, you can count on me. Brothers and sisters, you can count on me. I'm going to do, I'm going to do my part. Amen? I'm going to man my post. If it's counting the money offering, or if it's mowing the lawn, if it's leading the singing, if it's teaching the class, you can count on me. You can count on me to do what God's called me to do. Amen? And I'm going to count on you to do your part. And together, we're going to get the job done. Together, we're going to be what God's called us to be. Can you say amen? amen? We pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the example of the Apostle Paul, the manner of his ministry, motivated because of his great love for you, motivated because he had that revelation like we have of how much you loved us and what you did on the cross for us, that our hearts are ignited, our hearts are set aflame for you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus, and we want to serve you. Our motive is to please you. And therefore, our manner, we will serve humbly, sacrificially, with excellence, with endurance. We'll give you our very best. We'll love people and see people through your eyes. We'll weep over what you weep over. We're willing to endure things if your will would be done and you would be pleased. Father, help each one of us to carry out your call on our lives. Everyone has a different role. Everyone has a different calling. Everyone has a different makeup. But Lord, whatever it is you've called us to do, let us be found faithful. Let us be found willing. Let us be found enduring. In Jesus' name and all God's people said. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you on Sunday.